G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle. In 30k and 40k, they often talk about using nuclear weapons, be it on destroyers in 30k or on the Mechanicum or even in 40k. Even though they have more deadly weapons in the arsenal, it can be argued, such as psychonic weapons and uh, vortex weapons, they still use radiation weapons a lot. Well, radiation weapons are something I know a lot about. I'm lucky that due to my previous background, I'm loaded up with knowledge on the matter, and I'm going to give you the 1000 foot overview of how radiation works. This is not light-hearted entertainment. This is more of an educational experience, and we're going to share some brutal truths about these weapons today. Now, I'm afraid we're going to have to talk some science, atomic theory in fact, but although I'll keep it light, there are some fundamentals you'll have to understand to know just how nasty this stuff is, and why you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of a radiation weapon now, or in 30,000 years time. In order to understand radiation, you have to understand the source. This means understanding the atom. The atom is a fundamental building block of everything and everyone. Atoms of a certain size and composition behave a certain way, and it's one of the ways you can separate the atom as a whole from the particles which make it up. These particles which make up an atom are electrons, protons, and neutrons, and the quantity of these determine which element you're looking at. For example, if you have 8 protons, 8 electrons, and 8 neutrons, well, you've got oxygen on your hands. If you think of an atom like a solar system, then the nucleus is the sun at the center of the solar system. It's made up of all the positively charged protons and Neutral neutrons, it's in the name. Then around this star orbit the planets, the negatively charged electrons. The electrons have a strange orbit, with the closest orbit consisting of no more than two electrons, and up to eight in every orbit beyond that. Now an element with a full orbit of electrons is usually incredibly stable. And these elements make up what we call the noble elements on the periodic table. These elements, except for helium, all have eight electrons in the outermost ring. Helium is a special little fellow who is so small, he only has the innermost ring with two electrons. Again, there's a little more to this, but this is the basics, so forgive me for not diving deeper, but we will spend all day talking about this if we want to turn you all into chemists, and I'd still miss a ton. Now, if having uh, a full ring of electrons is a good thing, what happens when you have just one electron off that? Well, the atom gets a little angry. Elements which have just one or seven electrons in their outermost ring are incredibly reactive. Fluorine is the next chap along from oxygen in the periodic table and is so reactive it's actually hard to store pure fluorine on the planet. Another element with seven electrons is chlorine, which is incredibly poisonous to humans, hence its use in the First World War as a first poison gas. Sodium at the other end of the periodic table, he contains just one electron in the outer shell and basically explodes in the presence of other elements. That's how reactive it is. However, soft buttery sodium combined with that greenish yellow chlorine gas Combined together, they become relatively harmless table salt, classic sodium chloride, uh, which, of course, this channel is made of. Now, dangerous and reactive elements seeking balance and hating themselves can often join with others and find harmony, just like iron warriors. All you have to know for now is that reactive elements are dangerous because they will take other elements trying to do their job in your body hostage and something like chlorine gas, it bonds with your blood cells instead of oxygen, it won't let go, which is how it kills you. That's oversimplifying it, but you get the idea. Now we get to radioactive elements. Now when it comes to radioactive elements, you're dealing with something altogether different. These are elements which aren't reactive as such, instead they are unstable. They have extra parts, not enough to turn them into another element, just enough that they will literally shed them because they want to return to a lower state of energy, something more stable, something more comfortable. This shedding of unwanted particulates is what we call radiation, 
as the shed particles that result from this are thrown away as either particles or energy. Elements can shed for a long time, and the rate at which they decay is what we call half-life. This is, more or less speaking, the amount of time it takes for half of a mass of material to shed its radiation. This can be in the timescale of tens of thousands of years for many of the nastier elements, and it means that severely impacted areas can, and likely will, remain that way, more or less until literally after the time of 40k. After the cleanup efforts on Bikini Atoll, for instance, the material placed into a containment dome then was encased in concrete. However, it will remain dangerous within that dome for the next 47,000 years or so. Anyway, moving along. There are four main types of radiation, three which everyone knows, and an oddball. The three main ones, of course, are alpha, beta, and gamma. The oddball is neutron radiation. All you need to know for now is that if you have to play with the stuff, put some water jerrys between you and it, and you're probably safe. But I thought I'd mention it just for a bit of extra trivia. When we discuss the radiation types, yes, there are subtypes for those who know. You might get beta negative, double proton emission, double positron emission. But for the purposes of an introduction to this gruesome subject, I must once more place a disclaimer here that I cannot include at all. But if you're curious, look it up, and if you know as much as I do, or more, please understand why I'm simplifying it. So let's start with Gamma. Gamma, everyone knows it, because you think of popular characters in, you know, comics, for example, The Incredible Hulk. Gamma is the most penetrative radiation. It needs a lot of shielding to stop it, and no equipment made for humans to wear will stop it. It will only buy your time. Gamma radiation, in reality, is a photon, a light emission, and thus is so infinitely small that it's able to pass through solid objects without hitting the mostly empty space within those objects, within the atoms themselves, which are mostly empty space. Beta radiation's next, and beta is what you get when an unhappy little atom decides to ditch an electron or two. This is like a billiards ball, and when it's shed, it flies out like a bullet, and this reactive little guy wants a new home. But unfortunately, if he does hit something, it's just like that little billiards ball hitting the brake. It will literally tear apart other objects. This is how radiation damages you. It hits important objects, like your DNA, and it shreds it to pieces. The more radiation, the more DNA is likely to get damaged. And if your DNA is a big line of code, like instructions for you to function, if you lose that code, that's bad, right? Well, we'll get back to it. Alpha radiation is the nastiest. Alpha is what happens when a proton is ejected from an atom. And if a beta electron is like a billiards ball, well, an alpha proton is like a small asteroid in comparison. They're huge compared to electrons. And it's not only being shot out like a cannonball, but it's so large, the chances of it hitting something are way higher. Now, thankfully, due to its size, apart from a few exceptions like your eyes, on the whole, human skin is resilient enough to stop most alpha particles, within reason. Beta will be stopped by most inert carbon chemical suits, no worries as well. So, when I mention before that damaging your DNA is bad, I should probably explain to you just how bad. Imagine you've read a book, you studied it for a test, and during that test, it's an open book test, and you have to reference that book throughout. Now, in comes alpha radiation, it just blows a hole straight through the middle of that book and blows out the wall behind you. You can't reference the book now, and if there's enough radiation in that room, maybe all the other books will get blown away too. You're failing the test. But of course, the human body isn't a test, it's an organism. And when the instructions for running you are gone, what does your body do? Well, it depends on the severity. An x-ray or two mm, won't do much. You might see an increased white blood cell count, in fact, for a short while if you're around enough. But if it's something more, well, it gets nasty. So if you have a weak stomach, maybe turn this one off. It starts with nausea. Not long after the exposure, usually, a person will be feeling pretty good, up until they start vomiting. A host of symptoms, they'll occur next. Now, you may have some, you may have all of them. 
You might get diarrhea, headache, fever, dizziness, weakness, low blood pressure. But that's not so bad. That's a big night out, really. Vomiting, nausea, all that. Yeah, next comes the hair loss, then infections. Blotting your vomit and stool because now you're bleeding internally. You'll start to lose the ability to properly communicate with those around you. And you'll be suffering from signs of dehydration eventually due to imbalances in electrolytes. You'll suffer seizures, tremors, ataxia. You're going to shock and soon pass out. But it's not over. You see, this is the good part. It only gets worse. Far, far worse. Because our bodies are made up of cells which are in a constant state of dying and being replaced, when we have damaged DNA, we can no longer replace those cells. You're on a ticking clock. Multiple full blood transfusions and stem cell treatments may help in lesser cases, but in severe cases, it's just prolonging the inevitable. You see, your body is now rotting away, and you're in there for the ride. Your skin slowly starts to thin out until it breaks open and the fluids within you begin to ooze out. Your bones decay and rot internally, the marrow turning black as bacteria feast on you from the inside. You're racked with incredible pain, and now you cannot sleep as your body has lost that function. Sure, you might drift in and out of consciousness, but your brain is damaged and falling apart, like deleting files one by one off your computer in a random order. But you can't die. Your body is trying to survive. Maybe the doctors take pity on you. They want to give you painkillers. But that can't work. You see, there's no functioning blood vessels anymore. When they try to inject something into, well, they're just injecting a puddle of liquid into a puddle of flesh. It'll just stay in that area rather than circulating through you. They can't even give you a lethal injection at this point. So they'll do what they can for you. They'll wash you, they'll bandage you, they'll clean the weeping flesh that was your skin, and they'll have tubes in your throat and a supply of oxygen and food going to what's left of your internal organs. And you'll gain some sustenance from it as you're slowly wasting away, conscious, understanding what's happening to you. But it's inevitable, you will die. If you're lucky enough, you'll get enough radiation that you'll die quickly, a day or two, so that you skip most of this process. If you get help, well, there are people who live out months of this before finally being allowed to die. If you have a strong stomach, and I mean a strong stomach, look up Hisashi Uochi, a nuclear worker in Japan who went through this ordeal over 83 days. I'll not show you any images here out of respect to him or the viewers, but I will say this, radiation is probably the worst possible death that we can suffer. There is no joke here, no fun. It is absolutely horrifying, and I've seen enough of it to never want to see it again. Thankfully, fiction is a release from reality. And in fiction, we can think of how these weapons are employed. Firstly, and most directly, are the dirty weapons, such as the rad grenades. Rad grenades have a shell of radioactive material, such as cesium-137, wrapped around a high-explosive core. These grenades, when they explode, shower a victim in deadly particles, which can induce that vomiting and cellular decay almost immediately due to the amount of exposure. Even the Astartes, who are somewhat protected from this due to their unique DNA and self-repair, well, they can be doubled over by it and forced into spewing after extreme exposure. Marines can and will succumb if there's enough radiation. However, legions such as the Death Guard and Salamanders have extreme resilience towards it and it manifests in the dark skin tone of the salamanders, a clear sign of exposure in their genetics. It's what causes it, it's a reaction. The next type of weapon are irradiation cleansers. Now, these weapons work more like an x-ray machine. They project a cone of particles emitted under control and directed by the wielder. Whilst much safer than a rad grenade, it's still dangerous as secondary exposure can occur. There are also rad furnaces, these are unstable power reactors, which use the heat generated by decaying nuclear cores to power an object. These reactors bleed off small amounts of radioactive materials, usually in the form of heat, as mentioned. And in our current reality, actually, they're used to power deep space probes like Voyagers 1 and 2. In 30k, they're used to power creatures within the Mechanicum. Lastly, of course, there are atomics. 
Atomic weapons utilize the old E equals MC squared principle, which, hey, the most famous formula in the world, everyone knows it. Well, what it's telling you is that there's a lot of energy contained within a minuscule amount of mass, and if you multiply a known mass by the speed of light squared, well, your average cupcake could destroy this planet. There are two types of nuclear weapons we use currently, fission and fusion. In a fission bomb, such as those dropped in World War II, if you condense too much of a radioactive element into too small an area, such as compressing it with explosives or shooting one piece into another, well, it needs to vent all that pent-up energy you're creating by putting too much in too small an area. And it does this by blowing up. In fusion, instead of squashing enough together um, that it's angry, you squash so much together that it turns into something else, and it releases this energy violently. And you force all those little pieces of radioactive material together so tightly, it takes something like hydrogen, you squash it with another piece of hydrogen, you create helium, it gives off an awful lot of power. Our largest bombs utilize both techniques to function. And as a fun fact, our star operates on fusion. It's a controlled nuclear explosion where small elements are continually squashed together and release their energy. And that explosion is only held together by the force of its own gravity, an eternal struggle of trying to collapse on itself and tear itself apart. Now, nuclear weapons have a few things going for them. Firstly, there's the heat. You can incinerate an awful lot of stuff when you unleash about 100 million degrees of heat. Then there's the shock wave, or should I say, shock waves. You see, you don't blow up an atomic weapon on the ground or under it. That's just inefficient. You blow it up in the air, maybe 100 meters or a couple hundred meters above the ground. This means that after the sideways blast hits, it's followed by the rebounding blast that came out the underside of the bomb. And that rebounding blast that struck the ground is redirected sideways. And this sideways pressure wave is just as bad as the first. And before you're done, all that displaced air and matter needs to come back. So that shock wave passes back through twice more, filling in the vacuum created when it was pushed out of the way at a thousand kilometers an hour. After this, you now have all the leftover radioactive material to deal with. In modern bombs, it's not much. Uh, well, compared to World War II era technology, you see, nuclear weapons, they're complicated technology, as you'd imagine. When countries first develop them, they're winging it, because while they may be winging it with incredibly smart and talented people, they only have their best math to tell them what's going to happen, and unfortunately, reality is a little bit more difficult. Primitive nuclear weapons don't use all of the radioactive material, simply put. They, they just sort of disperse whatever isn't burnt, and it spreads into the surrounding area, maybe even around the globe a few times, before it settles. More modern weapons are much more efficient. They use up the material within them. And it's why they're so much smaller than the bombs you see dropped on Japan, and it's why they are so much more powerful, because the fuel they're using is used more efficiently. So there you have it. That's radiation weapons in 30k. I hope you've learned something here today. The basics and only the basics, sure. But hopefully you can understand the profound impact that nuclear weapons can have. Be they bombs or simply a pallet of something nasty dropped in someone's food. If you took the full import of this episode in, you'll hopefully have also gained some newfound understanding of why the bombs had such a profound cultural impact upon people in Japan. But leave the morality of it for another day. The last little bit of information I'll leave with you is this. Radiation is measured in a few ways, but greys are a common one. One to two greys generally has a mortality rate of about 5% or so with treatment. Two to six greys, that'll kill around half the people exposed, even with medical treatment. Six to eight will kill almost anyone who's exposed, unless they get major treatment fast. 8 to 30, it's basically a death sentence, but 1% of people exposed have survived it. Anything over 30 though, that's just death. During the bombing of Hiroshima, people within 1.6 kilometers or 1 mile of the blast absorbed over 9 grey. And in Nagasaki, those close to the heart, over 300. Make with the outer circle. 
don't play with atomic weapons. See you all next time.